Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, um, the first session um, of the Green Swans um, Conference um, run by the BIS. Um, so to start with, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our um, invited attendees. Um, housekeeping, oh, I'm Mama Ketirijane, let me start by introducing myself. I am the chair of um, the URSA board. And, um, and and as well as a um, strategist um, at Standard Bank in the in the in the global markets business, uh, and for today's session, um, I'd like to start with um, just a few housekeeping um, housekeeping notices. So the session is going to run um, like this. Each of the presenters um, is going to uh, have a 15-minute session where they will present their thoughts um, via a presentation, and we will offer an opportunity at the end of each session for um, the, 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 the audience to pose some questions. Um, after the speaker's presentations, we will have um, another session that is a panel discussion um, in the second hour um, of the session. And at the end of that panel discussion, there will also be an opportunity um, for the audience to um, answer, um, uh, ask questions um, for, for the panel to, um, to, to answer. Um, other than that, um, uh, we have four panelists um, at the session today. So we'll start with um, Doug Arendt. And Doug is an executive director um, who's focused on strategic public and private partnerships with NREL to transform energy economies at speed and scale across the globe. We will follow, we, Doug will be followed by James Thurlow, uh, who is the Director of Foresight and Policy Modeling at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Um, third will be Georgina Grennan, who has joined the organizing committee for the Paris 2024 um, Olympics and, and, and Paralympic Games as its Director of Sustainability. We will end uh, with Susan Kerr. Susan is a Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at, at the Environmental Defense, um, Defense Fund. We look forward to a very interactive and a highly informative session um, this afternoon. To start with, I'm going to hand over to our first um, panelist and presenter, Doug Arendt, um, who is going to start this session um, that we have titled today, Deploying Feasible Solutions at Speed and Scale. Please go ahead, Doug. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, for those of you who do not know, is a uh, a national laboratory in the United States. We've been focused on uh, clean energy solutions for uh, more than 45 years and uh, and work globally. So if I can go to the next slide, I'm going to actually go quite quickly, uh, assuming and hoping that the the material is, uh, at least some of the material is quite familiar. This is uh, quite an interesting stark uh, message from the recent IPCC uh, synthesis report, uh, just very clear on pace and scale, so very aligned with uh, the message of this, uh, this um, conference. And uh, in the next slide, if you go to that, uh, they talk about four bullet areas that are really needed uh, in terms of strategically focusing. The first, of course, is to cut emissions absolutely as quickly as possible and at least by 50% by 2030. That is a huge challenge given that it's only seven years away. Uh, scaling up practices and infrastructure to enhance resilience, that's also a key point and to work across the whole economy. So while I'm gonna focus on energy solutions, uh, be cognizant that there are also investment opportunities and needs in agriculture and other areas of the economy as well. So the next slide, if you would, very quickly, this one's a very simple message. We need to turn the Paris ambitions, the nationally determined contributions, the uh, subnational uh, ambitions that have been uh, announced around the world into implementation uh, and actionable replicable plans for investment, uh, for build out of infrastructure at an unprecedented speed and scale. And let me talk about why the technology is ready for this and uh, what the investment opportunities will look like. So if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna show you two pictures. Uh, skip this one if you would, and go to the next one. Next slide, please, yeah. Um, take a, a, just a moment, no, I'm sorry, back up. Yep, there you go. 
Uh, this is uh, what's called a Senke diagram, and it it actually shows the flow of primary energy sources for the globe uh, from uh, 2021 about uh, from the International Energy Agency uh, to its end uses. And you can see uh, thermal losses, you can see other losses, and you can see a predominance in this scenario of oil, coal, uh, and natural gas. So those are the purple, black, and blue uh, uh, streams on, on the left uh, going forward. And then there's a big bar in there, which is the conversion to power. A lot of that oil, coal, and natural gas, of course, is used directly into, into given sectors. What I want you to focus on is the contrast of that one to the next one, which is the flows of 2050 in their net zero scenario. So if you click the slide, please, you will see a pretty stark contrast here of the change that has to happen in the world energy system. So there is still oil, coal, and natural gas in 2050, but significantly reduced. And more importantly, what you see is a very large growth of technologies which come into the power sector or produce power as their primary output. So this is solar, wind, even advanced nuclear, other renewables and bioenergy, and then a deep electrification of end uses on the right. This is a change of appliances, industrial processes and things like that at the end use also represents an enormous investment opportunity. If you go to the next slide then, please. This is a summary of that investment world. Uh, this comes from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. There are multiples of these. I'm just showing one as an example. But it gives you a sense of the scale that is required in order to achieve this net zero world that is our collective ambition. And here, looking cumulatively, you can see, uh, actually, this is um, not cumulatively. This is uh, ongoing. No, this is cumulatively, so, excuse me. Uh, it's about 120 trillion, uh, 1.2 trillion dollars uh, annually. Sorry, this is annual uh, going forward. The bulk of it in the yellow is the energy generation technologies. So these are renewables, a little bit of nuclear energy storage. CCUS stands for carbon capture and utilization. Uh, there's a small bar of hydrogen in here, although hydrogen gets a, a lot of uh, airtime these days. And then the whole green bar is really on the electrified transport. So this is e-mobility. It's conversion of uh, rail and shipping, and we'll hear more about that, uh, and electrified heat. So this really represents a fundamental transformation of our energy sector and energy economy and represents an enormous investment opportunity. The next slide, please. Why wind and solar dominate the power sector and the energy sector? It's principally because of these phenomena. And here I won't spend time on the details, but these are two graphs that come from Lazard, uh, one of the uh, advisors in the in investment world. And they track the levelized cost of power available or power produced from wind and solar, natural gas, coal, nuclear, et cetera. And here, what you can see is that over the last decade or so, uh, wind has dropped on the order of 75% and solar somewhere in the 80 to 90%. And that's just the last decade. If I were to have done this for two decades, you would have seen cost reductions on the order of 90, 95%, which means that in most countries around the world, building new available power generation is most cost effective with wind and solar. And most importantly, we know how to integrate that into power systems up to very, very high percentages. For example, 75 or 80% is quite regular these days around the world. And so the paradigm that has existed uh, previously that said one needs to build backup one-to-one uh, -one for wind and solar, frankly, has been disproven. Uh, one needs to build solar, uh, uh, storage one-to-one -one for wind and solar has also been disproven. Uh, there have been numerous studies done and numerous systems operating around the world with more than 80, 90, and even 100% on instantaneous bases of variable renewables. 
and that it's shown that uh, these can very adequately be uh, adjusted through a combination of operational uh, elements and uh, technology elements and market design up to well more than 50%. So uh, next slide, if you would, please. Uh, this just shows the growth in a few of those sectors uh, in that net zero scenario. This is out to 2030, of course. Here you're looking at multiples of deployment, therefore multiples of capital, both in the manufacturing, but also in the deployment side of that equation, again, translates into this uh, billion, a, a trillion dollar per year, about 125 trillion estimated cumulatively out to 2050 investment opportunity. Next slide. Very quickly, I wanted to just show hydrogen because there is so much airtime on hydrogen these days. Uh, a real chase, if I can use that term, for creating green hydrogen economies in various uh, countries around the world. And here, this just gives you a sense that hydrogen is actually quite a uh, flexible molecule because it can be used either back into power, into mobility, converted via processes into uh, clean agricultural uh, chemicals, fertilizer, uh, as well as used for green steel and other pieces. Uh, but the, the paradigm of green hydrogen exports as a competitive advantage, uh, I believe, needs to be thought about very, very carefully. Also, the implications for creating clean hydrogen relative to the amount of power that is needed is also quite substantial, and one needs to be very cognizant of that. Next slide, please. Uh, let's just skip the, the words there. Next slide. Uh, if you click one more time, please. This just shows uh, two key takeaways from the World Economic Forum, where I'm a distinguished fellow, and their new program on clean power and electrification. Again, a couple of tidbits for you to remember, which is to be on the net zero pathway, we need approximately three times the amount of uh, power generation and concomitant transmission built in the next seven years, and nearly nine or 10 times by 2050. This again translates to this $125 trillion of investment opportunity, but it also means that we need to do things actually quite differently. So if you uh, click next slide twice, please. One more time. And then we'll see if a video runs. What I wanted to show you in the next slide is uh, the output of some very, very uh, detailed modeling for uh, the city of Los Angeles, as an example, where they asked the question, could our system run on 100% renewable, not 80 or 70, but 100%. And here you see the load profiles of the different buildings done at 15 minute intervals under an 80 or 90% renewable scenario. And then the next uh, little video you're gonna see is actually electric vehicle loads and all electric loads and the dominance then of where vehicle charging needs to play. And I, I put this video out for two reasons. One is that you can do this type of detailed analytics to inform investment theses and, in, and, in, and in implementation plans. And secondly, it's very important to understand where the infrastructure needs to be built over what time in order to do it correctly. So uh, one more slide and uh, just a, a, a thoughtful uh, quote that I like to think about, which is that it is the essential nature of a technology. It is not the essential nature of a technology that matters but its capacity to fit into the social, political, and economic conditions of the day. And I believe today we have a very unique positioning where society is very interested in these green technologies, investors are interested, countries, companies, and it aligns very, very well. And so uh, I wanna thank you for the next slide, if you would, I'll just uh, wrap up my remarks there and stop for questions, thank you. Thank you very much for um, for that, um, Doug. Um, as we as we indicated, could the audience please, as the presenters are presenting, if you have any questions, put them on the chat, and we will pose them um, um, uh, here. We've got one question for Doug. Uh, post his remarks now. Uh, Doug, what are some of the most pressing sectors to focus on to advance decarbonisation 
via investments? Um, the question is from Chloe Allison. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think as, as noted, um, the power sector is the key backbone sector for a green energy or a green uh, decarbonization economy. And so focusing there both on generation, uh, but potentially on end use transformation as well, is one of the primary sectors for near term opportunity. It represents uh, probably 50% of the investment needed uh, going forward toward 2050, about 50 to $60 trillion globally and uh, has a significant amount of opportunity. And as I said, for most green technologies, wind, solar, and hybrid configurations around the world, these are the most attractive economically and therefore the most assured in terms of return on investment. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation, Doug. Um, now we move on to the second uh, presenter today, James Thurlow um, from the Foresight and Policy Modeling at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, James, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so Doug has talked about the um, the energy system, and I'm going to talk about the food system. and And I'm going to do three things in my short presentation. I'm I'm going to start by explaining what I mean by an agri food system. and And although I agree with Doug that the power sector is is certainly our number one priority, um, number one sector for focusing new investments. Um, I think um, what I'd also like to show is how the um, how the agri food system transitioning to a net zero food system is, is going to be absolutely central as well to our achieving our climate change objectives. The second thing I'll do is flag, at least from my perspective, what I think that the two sort of uh, major challenges are that we're going to face um, as we try and achieve that net zero transition, two of the strongest headwinds that I think are going to make our lives difficult, even though this transition is essential. And then the third thing is I'm going to offer just two solutions. There are many, but I'm going to flag two that I think what I'm calling uh, transformative solutions, which are ones which I think, uh, you know, where we have the technologies and policies available, where we know what needs to be done. And I think if we're able to achieve it, um, it could have significant impact at scale. Next slide, please. So on this slide, um, and I have three slides to go with my, my three points. So this first slide is looking at what, what I mean by an agri-food system. Um, and on the left-hand side, uh, one way of looking at the agri-food system from very much an economist perspective is to think about what the agri-food system contributes to, say, GDP or to the economy. And you can see here um, some uh, measures from 2019 um, on the bottom left-hand side the contribution of the agri-food system to the to national GDP, in this case, global GDP. And we're going to think of the agri-food system as being far more than just primary agriculture. I think crops, livestock, forestry, and fishing. It's far more than that. It's all the downstream activities that are related to food supply and consumption. So it includes all the food processing within the manufacturing sector, all the trading and transporting of food and agricultural products from farm to factory to markets to final consumers. It also includes food services. You can think here restaurants, meals outside the home, and so on. And then also all those input suppliers that are providing the fertilizers and, and the energy and other, uh, other domestically produced inputs that are used by the farmers and the processors and so on. It's a limited framework, but it allows us to actually measure uh, the contribution to GDP. And what you can see on that bottom left-hand side is that the agri-food system globally um, and as a whole, is about 13% of the global economy, 12.9%. And that is substantially larger, three times larger globally than, say, the contribution from just primary agriculture, which is about 4%, 4.2%. Right, you can also see just how important the agri-food system is in low-income countries, LICs, compared to high-income countries. Just to the right of that figure, you can see the share of the agri-food system in total GDP. It's a breaking, sorry, um, the, the breakdown of total agri-food system GDP. And you can see that there is a transition that takes place as countries move from low to middle to high income status. And in particular, more and more of the development happens off the farm. And so it requires a lot more complex interventions in order to try and reduce emissions in the broader agri-food system. 
Those emissions are shown on the left-hand side. What is the contribution of the agri-food system to global emissions? And it's somewhat um, comparable, uh, sort of um, looks similar to what we were looking at in terms of GDP. Here we're thinking about different sources of emissions, and in grey we've got the emissions coming out of really primary agriculture. Think land use change, so that's deforestation and other things, uh, livestock, um, and then also other farm, which other on-farm activities, which includes energy use and, agric and agriculture and so on. Um, but then there's also some off-farm, off the food processing, the production of fertilizers and other inputs, and then the trade and transport and consumption of foods itself. And you can see on the bottom left-hand side of this box on the right that the agri-food system accounts for about a third, 30% of global emissions, so much larger than its contribution to global GDP. You can also see how important the primary agricultural sector is in generating emissions within low-income countries. And it's very much driven by two things. It's driven by land use change, think, think the clearing of lands to make way for crops, and then also by, uh, by livestock. And in fact, because these are so big um, within the agri-food system, and because the agri-food system is such a large contributor to global emissions, it means addressing land use change and addressing emissions from, from the livestock sector are a global priority as well. Perhaps not on the same scale as, as the power sector, but certainly not, not insignificant. Next slide, please. So we're going to face, in this context of land use change, we're going to focus in on land use change and livestock. And, and I think this is where we face those headwinds, those major challenges. On the left-hand side, I think one of the major challenges we're going to face is the fact that so much agricultural growth, particularly in the developing world, which will be a significant contributor, an increasing share of emissions globally going forward, so much of the agricultural growth is driven by land expansion, basically the clearing of lands to make way for new crops as rural populations grow. And here we're going to focus in on Africa, for example, where much of the growth, the future economic growth and agricultural growth is going to happen in the future. And you can see that bringing new lands under crop cultivation has been the main driver. I'm showing here, this is the value of crop production. It's not agricultural GDP entirety, um, but it's the value of crop production on the bottom left. And you can see between 2000 and 2021, the value of crop production doubled in Africa, right? Almost doubled. And I've, I've estimated what the contribution is from three different drivers of agricultural growth. The first is land expansion, so just literally bringing new lands under cultivation. The second is increasing the productivity of the crops that are grown on those lands. And then the third is the diversification, sort of moving up the value chain ladder, moving up the value ladder from low value cereals, for example, to high value horticulture and export crops. All of those can drive agricultural growth. What is absolutely clear from this figure is that the majority, two thirds of agricultural growth in Africa based on these data um, was driven by land expansion. And so that's gonna make it extremely difficult for us to sort of turn and chart a new pathway going forward. We're gonna to have to cut back deforestation and land clearing if we're to achieve our, um, if we're to reduce those emissions from land use change, but doing so requires a completely different growth model for, men, for much of the developing world and especially in Africa. The second on the right-hand side is, um, we talked about livestock emissions. The truth is that demand for animal sourced foods is going to grow, right? Um, we know that as countries' incomes rise, demand for animal sourced foods, meat, milk, and so on, rises with, with incomes. You can see here in this little figure on the right-hand side, um, what is the share of food? Firstly, what is the share of food in total household consumption spending? And you, yes, it does fall as countries move from low to lower middle to upper middle income status, right? So the share of food falls. But what you notice is that the share of animal source foods does not fall. And in fact, if we look, if we break down just the food expenditure budget, the share of animal sourced foods rises as a portion of the consumer basket as, as, countries, as countries develop. And so we're really looking at a tremendous headwinds. We're gonna to have to be creative in how we address the livestock sector challenge um, in reducing emissions. Um, uh, in reality, what we're likely to see is demand for livestock products double as low-income countries move to middle income, uh, lower middle-income status and double again um, if past trends are, are to continue as they move to upper middle-income status. Next slide, please. So those are the two big challenges that we face. And so I'm going to offer, I said some, but actually it's just two, 
two transformative solutions that I think could have impact at scale. And, and they are by no means trivial. And, and unfortunately, unlike in the power sector, as Doug was showing, the costs of the technologies needed to drive this change are not always falling. Um, so the first is, I think there are substantial gains to be had, and I'm certainly not the first to say it, from attempting to reduce food loss and food waste. Right? Food loss and food waste happens throughout the supply chain, from the production on the farm, through the post-harvest and processing, and all the way through to the final consumer. At the moment, you know, the most recent global estimates, and these numbers are very difficult to come by, but the most recent global estimates suggest that as much as, say, 14 or 15 percent of the global food supply is lost from just the production and processing stages of the, of the food supply chain, and that even more is lost but difficult to measure from food consumption and, and distribution. We've done a little study at IFPRI where we looked at just three countries, at Kenya, Bangladesh, and Nigeria. And you can see here in the bottom left-hand side just what share of food is being lost at different stages in that supply chain. What we're seeing here with most losses occurring, a larger share of losses occurring in the production and post-harvest stages, think on the farm, that is quite typical of a developing country. In a, in a developed country, it flips around, and actually most of the, the food waste is happening um, amongst in food consumption. Think about your own house and sometimes some of the food that you're discarding at the end of the day. And so I think um, you know, we have technologies that are available that could make a significant impact on production and processing. Think storage, cold, uh, better harvesting practices. Um, but there's also a big uh, role for policy, for example, in shifting consumer preferences and diets and making consumers aware of food loss and food waste. Not a trivial exercise, but I think it's a, it's, and a monumental task, but I think it's one that could bring about a, a transformative change. And then finally, on the right-hand side, how we go about reducing livestock emissions. There's a lot of um, research that very rightly, within the climate space, that very rightly focuses on changing consumer diets, and in particular, reducing meat consumption. And I think that may well be true. Perhaps 20 or 50 or 100 years from now, many of us will be vegetarian or more vegetarian than, than we are today. Um, but I think that's a long journey. And I think it's a difficult sell in certain parts of the world. I think there, are some scope, there is some scope to uh, switching to less emissions intensive animals, animal sourced foods, think chickens instead of cows. Um, but I think the key here is that there are some more readily available solutions, technologies on the table that can help us raise productivity. You can see in this little figure here, the gray bars is the, um, is the animal productivity across uh, countries of, at different income levels. And you can see that, you know, in terms of kilograms per animal, per cattle, per cow, um, the productivity is substantially higher in high income countries. And as a result of that, the emissions per kilogram of meat is dramatically lower. And so it is possible, conceivable, that demand for meat in developed, developing countries could quadruple, right? Um, if productivity gains and the technologies that are required to make that happen can be um, uh, disseminated and adopted and put into practice, um, even without raising emissions. So I think um, we've got a tremendous, tremendously long path ahead of us. Um, I'm not going to say it's simpler than in the power sector, uh, more complicated than in the power sector, but I think it is a challenge and it's one where we know what the solutions are. We just need a concerted effort to make them, uh, make them realized. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, James, for for that very um, interesting presentation. Uh, looking at questions now, uh, we're just going to go through one question. I think we went through um, quite a bit um, um, in your in in your presentation. So, uh, James, technologies often have a late mover advantage. How do we avoid countries slowing down the transition to net zero food systems while still allowing them to take advantage of lower technology costs? I think um, I think I would I would I'm not entirely sure if countries are slowing down their food system development in order to sort of delay and take advantage of, of lower costs, lower technology costs. I think in many ways, the trends that we're seeing right now in the food system are already the low cost pathways. Think of that rapid land expansion. And the reason why those are the low technology options is because, you know, the environmental and climate implications of rapid land expansion are just not costed properly, right? They're all a negative externality that's uncosted. 
And so I think the challenge for us is actually to encourage the adoption of new technologies um, that may actually be uh, more expensive in, in many cases. I think we've got a couple of things that are uh, going for us. I think the first is that, you know, Many of these new technologies that are needed in the food system, they're not just good for the climate, but they also make a lot of sense for development. Um, they make economic sense. Um, and so, and, and the, many of the technologies and policies are well known. Their, their effectiveness is, is sort of well established. I think the other thing that we've got going for us is, um, is that you know, a lot of those technologies and the infrastructure and so on that's needed in the food system, in many of the low-income countries where much of the emissions may come from in the food sector in the future, you know, these technologies and, and infrastructure, they don't exist yet. Um, and so they've yet to be made. These investments have yet to be made. And that gives us a great opportunity to pivot uh, to a, a, a lower carbon uh, development trajectory. I think the key is going to be sort of incentivizing these, these, these cleaner technologies, even if they are at a higher cost and are more complicated to administer. I think we've got a lot of global funds that are sort of helping developing countries move to that, that to make that low carbon uh, transition. But, but I think we've still got this bifurcation of development planning on the one hand and climate planning on the other. And I think we need to bring the funds together. I think we need to bring the policy processes together um, so that we are not uh, working in these two different silos. And, and then I think we'll see a, a, a more rapid uh, sort of alignment of, of, of our development and climate objectives. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, James. I'm sure we'll come back to the discussion um, when we, we, we have the panel in the second hour. Uh, but for now, uh, I'd like to hand over to Georgina, who is um, the Director of Sustainability at the Organizing Committee for the Paris 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Georgina, over to you. After what Doug has shared, hello, is it good? Okay. <clears throat> so I was saying thank you very much for the invitation. And um, after what Doug has shared, uh, what, what James has shared, uh, many of you may wonder what are the Olympic and Paralympic Games doing in this session? Um, and actually, uh, the idea is to share with you some thoughts on how, as the biggest event in the world, we are addressing <clears throat> the challenges that we just shared. Um, so maybe if we go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, in exactly 422 days, uh, we will be opening the Olympic Games in Paris with a big ceremony in the sand for the first time outside of the stadium. Um, and in 455 days, we'll be opening the Paralympic Games at the heart of Paris as well. So, you know, time is ticking for us. Um, we are, uh, next slide, please. We're really the, the organizing the world biggest event, uh, hosting them for any city or any country in the world means hosting 15,000 athletes for more than 200 delegations, 32 Olympic sports, 22 Paralympic sports, 45,000 volunteers, 20,000 journalists, uh, and more than 3 billion TV viewers. So I'm not going to read all those numbers, but you get the message is really, really big. And as the world's biggest event, we are facing humanity's biggest challenges. You know, some of what Jai was saying, what James was saying. Um, and it was very important for us to take the opportunity to make these games more sustainable, you know, to address those challenges for ourselves, uh, but also to use these games in a sense as an accelerator for a more sustainable world. So if we move to the next slide, and now we have focus uh, largely on the uh, environmental aspects. You know, I leave all the other sustainability aspects behind, um, aside, I'm sorry. Uh, and if I focus on the uh, environmental aspects, we focus on four different pillars. Securing the carbon neutrality, protecting and regenerating biodiversity, developing a more circular economy and bolstering resilience. And this, all these four pillars, apply to all the different um, things you know, that you need to do in order to deliver the games, the energy uh, you require, the infrastructure, the mobility, the catering, the digital that takes more and more impact, uh, and also the merchandising. You know, whatever you normally see as, as a, a spectator when you come to the games, but it's also all the back office, you know, everything that is happening behind. Um, so, we decided that for these games, we were going to set for ourselves very ambitious targets. 
um, and we'll move to the next slide. Um, the first one is to be the first game to fully aligned with the Paris Agreement. That means uh, reducing the emissions by 50% compared to previous games, and then whatever we cannot reduce, whatever we cannot avoid, um, you know, offset to the same level or even farther. Um, this is, you know, as I said, first games align with the Paris Agreement at a full scope three. Uh, so that takes, you know, including the, uh, the spectators that come by playing everything into account. Uh, and we are reducing the emissions by half and, and we are actually doing it, which is the important thing. And I'm going to share a bit more about this in a moment. Um, I was talking about circular economy. You know, we're applying principles on circular economy, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. Um, and again, every little thing we're doing, we had to come up with new ways of delivering these games. Um, if we move to the next slide, for that, we created strategies, we created uh, also tools and methodologies to support uh, each and every part of the organization into delivering this. And of course, this will remain as a legacy, we hope, for other games, but also for the sports in general, uh, and maybe for other businesses. And one of the reasons why I'm here today is that I think maybe some of the things we're going to be sharing could be uh, deployed in, in things other than events. Uh, and this will be, I'll be um, interested in knowing your opinion as well and through your questions as well uh, later on in the exchange. Um, so now, if we focus particularly on climate and on carbon, um, maybe next slide. One quick, you know, one question we're getting very often is, how are you actually doing it? You're saying that you're reducing your emissions by 50%. This is in 2024, so this is not in 2030, not in 2050, this is in 2024. Um, what are the, um, you know, how uh, have you tackled this to actually do it? So if we move to the next slide, it all started very, very early on and comparing uh, what we thought could be our games with the previous games. You know, took an average of uh, London and uh, the Rio uh, editions, you know, 2012 and 2016. Um, and when we estimated our model, you know, our rethought model, we believed we could uh, deliver these games with half of the emissions. Um, this took a lot of very structuring decisions to be made very early on, uh, among which the fact of using 95% of existing or temporary infrastructure does it, that is uh, building a lot less than previous games um, and holding, only building um, useful things. So we're building a village, we're building a, a stadium. One single stadium is being built just for the games, which is the, uh, um, the swim stadium, the aquatic center. And it responds to the needs of the local territory. Uh, and so not only we're building a lot less, but whatever we are building, we're building much, much, much lower carbon than an average construction today in France, you know, I would say, or a good construction today in France. Uh, so for example, the Olympic Village, we're talking about 30% uh, less uh, on, on a per square meter uh, carbon footprint compared to a good construction average today in France. Um, so that is, you know, applying new technologies, new ways of constructing, but above all, setting the ambition, setting this objective, um, you know, to keep the emissions under control. Um, if we move to the to the next slide, let me show you, this is the estimated uh, emissions for the games. Of course, it's not um, a footprint yet because the games haven't happened, uh, but it's our best estimate to date uh, on what is a scope three level uh, what should be uh, roughly the emissions of the games. Um, and you see three thirds. Uh, one third is transportation, uh, of which spectators account for a quarter of the total impact in this estimate. Uh, a third is construction, because as I said, we're building very little um, and we're building low carbon, but still construction has an impact because we're taking 100% of the impact. We're not taking the you know, share of the usage of a year, I would say, of the Olympics, we're taking everything into account, uh, the totality of the impact. 
Um, and then the third third is everything else, right? Um, so in a nutshell, what we have direct control on, what we can make decisions on, uh, it's, it's the green part of the chart. Uh, it's also uh, the blue because of the constructions, uh, but we have very little, uh, you know, impact, <laughs> very little power into deciding how people are going to come uh, to the games. And yet we're taking uh, the totality of the impact into account. But the interesting thing for you, I think, is to know that out of these estimates that we have made very early on, we have made, we have turned that into a budget, into a carbon budget. So anyone in, in the Paris 2024 organization, uh, any director, for example, they know their financial budget, you know, how much money you can spend in the, in the, uh, uh, in organizing the part of the game you are responsible for, but there's also a carbon budget. So with how many emissions you can deliver the same function. Um, this has been very, very interesting tool because over the years we are recalculating these estimates regularly. We're working with each direction, directorship to uh, keep emissions under control, to try to reduce them further, if we can, to re-estimate, to refine the calculations. And again, aside of the figures, aside of the specific number in number of tones, this has been a tool to have a climate dialogue, you know, and for all of us as an organization to be responsible for delivering on our carbon estimates, on our carbon commitments, uh, you know, in this alignment with the Paris Agreement. Um, and again, this has helped us uh, keep emissions under control, you know, and fight and continue to reduce emissions whenever that's possible. Um, now, if we move to the to the next slide, let me give you an example of an application of that. That's energy. You know, Doug was talking about energy early on. Um, we decided that these games were going to be the first games to be 100% fed with um, renewable energy. Uh, back in 2018, when we were, you know, telling the world about this challenge, everyone was telling us this was not going to be possible. And actually, it is possible. It's not simple, but it's possible. Uh, and one important matter for everyone to know is that when you're talking about sports or events in general, there's still a massive use of diesel generators. You know, a stadium in a normal day of, of operation, when there is, especially if there is TV transmission, it operates under these generators. Uh, and the grid, you know, the, the energy coming from the grid um, comes as backup. We wanted to change this, um, especially because in France we have a, a, a very good grid. You know, the quality of the grid is, is, is trustable. Uh, so we said, well, for these games, we want to. Um, decarbonize somehow the power supply of our stadiums. Um, it took us a lot of work, but now we can uh, proudly say that this is the way the games will operate. Um, and there's also another innovation, which is um, creating what we call low carbon event zones, that is areas in which there is not enough electricity. I mean, the grid is not strong enough, uh, so we are installing um, this like temporary plugs, but that will remain as permanent, but hidden. So that means if this is an area in a city where there are events organized in a regular way uh, that we're using diesel generators, well, from now onwards, there will be um, this sort of big plugs uh, that can be pulled up uh, and then used for the events. So that's avoiding uh, diesel generators, not only for the games, but for all the events that will happen after the games. Um, and because sometimes we will still need to use generators, either as backup or as generators for temporary electricity in, in sort of some distributed areas in which it doesn't make sense uh, to connect the grid. Well, in those cases, uh, we will be using either uh, hydrogen powered uh, new um, new equipment, new generators, or batteries, or if we need to use the, I would say the old generation um, uh, generators, we're going to be using biofuels to feed them. So all in all, we are aiming, and you know we still have one more year to go, but we're aiming to be the first games to use zero diesel 
uh, for uh, is electricity generation, where previous games like London were using, for example, 4 million liters. That's the equivalent of about 200 trucks uh, full of diesel. Um, again, with this particular example, I'm not trying to say this is perfect, but it's one of the many examples of how to rethink a model, a model that has been operating for a hundred years, like the games, and can still be challenged and can still be, um, you know, opportunities for improvement can still be looked for. Uh, and in this case, you know, in traditional sectors like even energy, right? I could speak about uh, food, for example, uh, we'll be serving the entire uh, food uh, of the game, 13 million meals, with half of the carbon impact, uh, or say every, every one of our meals on average will have half of the carbon impact of an average French meal today. Uh, and again, a, a lot of uh, calculations on how to uh, cut the emissions of the food service. I'm gonna stop there for the time being, uh, and uh, you know we may hopefully get to discuss some of the other points later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, um, Georgina. Um, you know, it, it, there is quite a lot to go through, um, and as we can see, you've like tried to condense quite a bit of information into um, very little time. We'll definitely explore it um, later. But there's one quick question uh, that came through from the audience from um, Catherine Bankard. So she asks, uh, you know, or she comments initially, and she says it's great to see such a concerted effort in this area. But also she asks, you know, she's curious um, as to the net cost effect of greening the games. Is it more expensive or cheaper than doing it the usual way? Well, that's a great question. And um, I'm afraid is a question we get all the time, right? Um, you know, um, when you try to do more with less, it's not necessarily more expensive. And this is part of the story we want to share as well. Um, when you challenge the needs, for example, and, and we try to be more frugal, uh, you, you realize that you can actually make economies. So um, in the case of energy, I was telling you, we're saving an enormous amount of diesel uh, and using uh, the grid electricity, renewable electricity, uh, which happens to be at the end of the day cheaper uh, than uh, the electricity you can serve from diesel generators. So it, it is not necessarily more expensive. This is what people usually think. Uh, in our case also, we are a private organization. We're in a private association. So our budget is whatever we make out of our revenues. We don't get subsidies or very little, actually 4% only for the Paralympic Games, which means we have to cover for our expenses. So we mind every penny <laughs> in our model. And this is where, um, you know, we had to work very hard to make sure that the solutions were more sustainable, but also compatible with our means. Thank you um, very much, Georgina. We'll probably come back to some semblance of this discussion um, in, in the panel. But um, now, last uh, but not least, we're moving through to our fourth um, panelist and presenter today, Susan Kerr, who is the Senior VP and Chief Economist at the Ev Environmental Defense Fund. Over to you, Susie. Tēnā koutou katoa, or greetings to you all and Māori the indigenous language of New Zealand where I'm from. We have a huge challenge ahead, but many of the solutions are all ready, ready to deploy at scale, and we're learning more all the time. So I'm optimistic. If we can do this right, it's a huge economic opportunity and one that could raise well-being in all countries, as well as avoiding the worst effects of climate change. Next slide. But we have challenges. The Climate Policy Initiative estimates that $4.5 to $5 trillion in clean investment, and this is a conservative estimate, is needed annually by 2050 to avoid the worst climate damages. Clean investment must increase dr drastically. It must increase soon. Next slide. If we're to be on track to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees in a relatively cost-effective way. Next slide, please. By 2030, 
around three quarters of the reductions need to happen in developing countries. That's where the untapped opportunities are, but that's not where the wealth and investment capital is. Next slide, please. So clean investment is finally growing, but with the exception of China, most clean energy investment is still in high income countries. Emerging market and developing economies account for two thirds of the world's population. And these are also the regions where we're going to see the majority of population and income growth in the coming decades. But only two thirds of the total energy investment and 20% of global investment in clean energy technologies is being directed to them at the moment. Next slide, please. Another tranche of the capital needed is for natural climate solutions, such as avoiding deforestation and improving the efficiency of food systems, which James talked about. Stopping irreversible damage to the rainforest we depend on is urgent. The Forest and Climate Leadership's part partnership estimate that halting and reversing forest loss and land degradation would deliver 10% of the climate mitigation action needed by 2030 to deliver on the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. Working together now to make reductions in the places where they're lowest cost would allow us to double our climate ambition at no cost. This trade in emissions reductions makes economic sense for us all, but protectionism in this space is ferocious. Countries want to do their reductions at home, but we can't solve a global problem with action that is mostly focused in richest countries, because that's simply not where the emissions are. Next slide. So right now we have two ways to move money where it's needed to finance and subsidize clean capital investments. Government aid and corporate action, and both are important, but they will not scale enough. Voters simply won't let their governments give away or even lend trillions of dollars. And voluntary corporate action at its very best could never support more than 10% of the reductions we need. These levels of public sector investment in this picture look impressive, but they're not so impressive when you compare them to the total funding needs, which are an order of magnitude or more higher. Next slide, please. But enough of the doom and gloom. I want to paint a different picture for you. And to do it, I want to take you to two places I've called home. The first is here, Karikari Beach. To me, it's the most beautiful place on earth. I grew up going here, picnicking with my mum, exploring wild coastlines, whitewater kayaking. My love of the land was born here. I was also raised to care deeply about fairness. That's what New Zealand was founded upon, fighting the class system and corruption. Next slide. Today, New Zealand's a modern and wealthy country, and it's serious about its commitment to the Paris Accords. It's imposed the world's second highest carbon market price on all fossil fuels, and over 80% of our electricity comes from renewables. It promotes reforestation, and it even plans to regulate cow burps from my farming friends' herds. But we Kiwis can't do our fair share on climate only by acting at home. We need to go elsewhere to find more opportunities to contribute. Next slide, please. So let's go to Valdivia. This is where I lived when I spent a year with my girls when they were little. Every morning, we walked along the gorgeous Rio Caje Caje, past the basking sea lions and the pelicans to the fish market. But we'd also hear about schools where teachers simply don't come. And we saw homes where children share beds in tiny shacks that flood when it rains. This country is serious about climate change too. They have an ambitious commitment under the Paris Accords and a solid plan for moving to renewable electricity. Next slide. But Chile is still classified as a developing country. It's heavily reliant on coal. It's working hard to lift people out of poverty. It can't afford to move as fast as the climate requires. And honestly, thinking about that fundamental principle of fairness I was born into, it's not fair 
for a country like Chile to bear the full cost to solve problems that it didn't create. Next slide. And it's possible to make dramatic changes in developing country emissions if you have an all out effort locally and, and at national scale. And Brazil showed us this for deforestation under the previous Lula government. So this figure shows uh, deforest, annual deforestation rates which were completely exploding until they brought in a really focused package of effort, at which point deforestation dived. And the really impressive thing about this is, well, the impressive things are two. First, that that fall in deforestation, while it didn't get to zero, it has lasted despite political changes in Brazil. And food production in this area, this is in Mato Grosso, uh, continued to rise. So they avoided that conflict between food and forests. And they didn't do this with just one policy instrument. The different approaches that they've taken take advantage of different opportunities and address different needs. And we don't know which ones are most effective. So it's a good idea to try out a lot of different options. Next slide, please. So, sorry, next one. So two fundamental things are needed to enable a rapid climate transition in developing countries. These can then support what I call the mitigation delicious package of policies and actions at all scales that add up to large scale change that developed countries can support with confidence and that can mobilize private profitable investment at scale. So what would this look like for avoiding deforestation? You do need to have a vision at the economy and society scale. You need to have some modeling to understand what is possible. You need to have local buy-in. And you also need trust and strong contracts because making these changes involves large transfers in cash, capital, and building of capability. Next slide, please. So the seeds of the avocado for deforestation are the actions on the ground. In the case of avoiding deforestation, this involves defending forests, it involves intensifying agriculture so you don't have the same pressure on land, uh, and it may involve reforestation. And this requires uh, a lot of local resources. There are, there are ways of creating local incentives through policies, and then it requires local resources for the sorts of activities I have listed here. Next slide, please. But as Ed, any gardener knows, it's not enough to plant seeds if you want an orchard. You also need to create an environment in which the young plants can thrive. And in the case of avoiding de deforestation, that involves things like credit systems that support intensification of agriculture instead of clearing of more land. There are reasons for the jurisdiction, uh, whether that's the, the state or the country to do that because of co-benefits to achieve the NDC, or maybe because they are being offered finance from another country. And they need those resources because there are a lot of resource needs to enable just transition, cover um, policy costs, and provide the capital and capability that is needed. Next slide, please. So if we put all these actions together, the local, very local scale and at the wider jurisdictional scale, we end up with layers of complementary actions and a total package that can really be transformational. Next slide, please. You could do the same thing for the electricity sector, the sorts of things that happen at a plant scale uh, and the sorts of things that are required at a national scale to change regulation, provide infrastructure, et cetera, that make those plant scale investments possible and, and effective. Next slide, please. So several initiatives are beginning to demonstrate how large scale programs leading to emission reductions on the scale we need can be supported with international resources so that this trade that would be so economically attractive can really happen. These initiatives include LEAF, uh, the Lowering Emissions uh, by Accelerating Forest Finance Coalition, 
They include also the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that started in South Africa and are now being explored more widely. And an initiative among two of my favorite countries, Chile and New Zealand, with some of their friends. These are all promising, uh, but many hurdles remain and they've only just started to mobilize the capital and support that is needed. Their success at scale depends on at least four features. So one is that it's designed to meet local conditions, to address local conditions. It gives agency to local actors. Second, you need to have a vision for where you're going. So what the success could look like, building on the sorts of modeling that James and Doug uh, are able to offer uh, to, to guide that transition. And if you're going to want large scale financial resources, you need to have some confidence uh, about the impact that your changes are actually making. And this is easiest to do if you're looking at a larger scale and if you're leading to truly uh, transformational change. And finally, and this is the part where I think many of the people in this audience are highly relevant, we need sophisticated financial contracts so that we can mobilize the action and the huge amounts of private finance that are needed. Next slide, please. So I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. We need people with private finance expertise to help design and implement finance mechanisms and manage the, the risks that are inevitably involved. And there are huge potential gains awaiting those who succeed in making this stuff work. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Susie, for um, for that uh, for that presentation. Um, thank you very much, Susie, for um, for that. Uh, for, um, We've, we've just got one question, I think, um, also your presentation is quite expansive and covered quite a bit. Um, but, you know, there's a question that's come from the audience uh, from Shantisa Ragavalu. And the question is, why could, why should a central banker or fund manager sitting in London pay close attention to mechanisms like this to mobilize clean investment for developing countries? And, 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 and as a secondary question, I suppose, and it's why is this any different from um, capital investment from other economic transformations, such as those driven by IT? That's a great question. Um, so they should pay attention because a large transition like this creates real opportunities. Uh, and, but also because of the speed, scale and location of the transitions needed, and given that the transition will at least in part be driven by and dependent on government actions, the risks associated with these investments will be different from the, risks, the, from the transitions like an IT transition. So central banks will want to understand these opportunities and risks in order to avoid instability. And of course, these transitions probably won't happen as fast as we need if the fund managers and leaders, such as central bankers, don't pay enough attention. We need their sophisticated finance and risk management skills. And if we fail to make the transitions happen fast enough, well, that is certainly going to lead to economic loss and instability. Thank you very much for um, for that, Susie. And I, I actually just reflected that somebody sent me an article that was in the FT a few days ago um, about um, LNG um, and investment house in the UK, um, you know, participating in this debt for nature, uh, debt, debt swap for nature deal, um, where they're investing in Ecuador um, on condition that um, the country actually starts to uh, preserve or continues to preserve the Galapagos. So it's kind of like this whole thing where you try and, and, and combine finance with getting better outcomes for um, for 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 the for the globe somewhere else. Um, so we'll see how this goes, but um, I think we we we're going to move this session now to a panel discussion, which is a lot more four way, um, a lot more interactive. Can I please remind the audience to put their questions in the Q and A um, on the chat if you're on Webex, um, so we can make this bring your thoughts up as well and make sure that whatever questions you have are addressed by um, our panelists. But moving. Um, Moving to the panel, I'll take sort of like the first round of questions um, and then we'll have another round 
and um, you know, at any point in time, we will bring in audience questions as well, um, just to facilitate um, 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 a more interactive discussion, as I said. But for the for the first round of questions, I would like um, to um, you know address this question to Susie and Doug. So. The availability of critical minerals has been seen as a major uh, obstacle to scaling up technolog technological solutions. The IEA estimates that the total global un anticipated investment in CEM mining until 2030 under a net zero energy scenario is between 180 billion and 220 billion against a required investment of 360 to 450 billion. So there's quite a big gap there. To what extent do you see critical minerals as an obstacle and how can we overcome this challenge? Um, that's for Susie and Doug. Whichever one of you would like to, to go first, please go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, so this is, this is a real challenge to mobilize this, largely because there are real trade-offs involved if we use critical minerals. I think we're hoping that technology will reduce our need for those, but but we're going to need a lot, as has been uh, stated. So the trade-offs are um, both uh, environmental because of the locations that these come from, either in the deep ocean or or on land, but also critically, they are equity uh, challenges. That these uh, minerals, in many cases, come from. Uh, communities who have already been exposed to a lot of pressures and already face a lot of challenges. Uh, and it's very easy for this extraction of minerals to happen on the same exploitative basis as it has in the past. So those are very difficult challenges to address, uh, but we have to face them because the alternative is that we don't have a clean energy transition and that's even worse for the communities who would be affected. So we need to empower those communities so they can negotiate really well. We need to minimize the damage that is caused either to communities or environments. And we need to have those real conversations really fast. Thanks, Susie, me, Doug. Yeah, let me add a couple of, uh, a couple of thoughts here. So um, I, I reflect that uh, um, the end of the Stone Age was uh, was not due to uh, the lack of stones. And so uh, just like uh, um, this energy transition is not going to be uh, because of lack of molecules, either oil, gas, or, or minerals. I mean, the Earth's uh, very abundant uh, in, these, uh, in these resources. And perhaps most importantly, for the clean energy transition, the dialogue that has now emerged among global leaders is about reformulating the uh, breadth and depth of the supply chains uh, to be resilient uh, geopolitically, uh, to support economic development uh, in all um, parts or all countries of those supply chains. Uh, and to do them in uh, to do development uh, quite sustainably. And so to, to Susie's point in terms of inclusive development of, of even on the extractive side, I think there's an increased consciousness of doing this in the most sustainable way. There's commitments of the mining industry, for example, to use clean energy technologies to use better practices or best practices for reducing environmental impacts. There's also a significant movement in reuse and recycling. And so we should not lose track of this as well. Uh, this is really very important right now. It's probably in the too early stage to be thinking about for, for major bank financing. But by 2040 and beyond, uh, this should represent, I believe, a significant investment opportunity uh, going forward. And there are major efforts on batteries, wind, solar, PV. Uh, all the minerals, minerals, etc. So I, I do think that there may be a gap today, but uh, in, in terms of the investment uh, uh, piece that was uh, was raised in the in the question, but I think that that's going to close actually quite quickly, and you're going to see more innovation come in to the minerals mining processing sector uh, to close that gap. 
thank you. Um, and moving on to James, um, you know, around agri. Um, one important way to reduce agri pro, pro, food pro, um, emissions and reduce poverty and inequality is through reducing food loss and waste, which is something I think that you outlined in your presentation. What role can policy and technology play here and what are the opportunities in developing uh, and developed, uh, developed economies? No, thanks. And I think I was a little bit thin on, on sort of what exactly needs to be done to reduce food loss and food waste. And I think it's a massive problem. And so I, I think identifying just a few interventions is probably always going to sort of shortchange the level of effort that's required to do that. Um, I think one of the things I, I did mention, and I think it's worth stressing, is that um, you know, we've got different policies and technologies depending on where you are in the world because the food loss and food waste is coming from very different parts of the food system. So I think I, I did mention um, in, in developing countries, most of the food loss um, is happening in the sort of farming post-harvesting parts of the food chain, the supply chain. Whereas when you move to high income countries, it's, um, it, it's in the food distribution, food, food consumption. Think your grocery store and then in your own kitchen um, and 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 so um, and so we need different technologies different uh, policies to tackle both ends of these um, of, of these sources of food loss and food waste I think you know you mentioned poverty and inequality and the other thing I should mention is that um, you know the beneficiaries of reducing food loss and food waste also differ uh, depending on where you are reducing those those losses so if you're reducing losses for farmers on their farm that means they've got more to sell because less has been lost and so therefore they can make higher incomes their farmers tend to benefit in low income countries from reducing food loss. But when you move to higher income countries and you improve the efficiency of, of food consumption, reduce the waste of food consumption, it means consumers need less food generally. And so therefore that has negative uh, sort of spillover effects onto farmers all the way back down to farmers because less food is needed in the system. So there is some political economy that needs to be played out around sort of um, the beneficiaries, the winners and losers from this. But I'm still, I'm hedging on giving you specific technologies. So in developing countries, um, you know, I think technology has a key role to play here. And I think we've got a lot of these technologies um, on the shelf already. I think we need better storage technologies. We may need better harvesting technologies, infrastructure, machines. Um, we certainly need improved processing facilities. A lot of food gets lost um, as part of the food processing um, stage. And then we need cold storage for, for perishable foods, um, including meats and animal sourced animal source foods. And so I think, you know, we're going to need in developing countries where we're, we're, um, we're going to need a lot of public financial incentives to, to sort of try and encourage the adoption of these technologies and infrastructure. I think, you know, there's a big role for the government there. In developed countries, I think you know there's still scope for technologies to help reduce food loss in the in the supply part, the, the production part of the supply chain. But I think policy's probably got a much stronger role in in uh, in developed countries. I think um, you know the one thing we need to do is is bring about behavioural change amongst consumers. I mean, we need to raise their awareness about the food that is being wasted and the implications of that for um, a whole range of other outcomes, including climate change. I think there's this key role for regulations. So, I mean, as, as simple as rethinking our sell-by dates on the foods that we're buying in grocery stores and so on. Mm -hmm. And then I think, and, and I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I don't actually know how to do this, but um, it's certainly a challenge, but you know, I think we may need to start thinking about how to price and tax waste um, and, and packaging that's left over at the end of the, um, of, of the, the food consumption stage. So, so I think we've got a lot of options and a lot of role, but, but like I said at the very beginning, there's no single technology, there's no single policy, and this is certainly not a simple, a simple objective, but, but it is potentially transformative and, and worth pursuing. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I, th I think I'd like to follow up a little bit on that. Um, one of the things that also came through in Suze's presentation, uh, as well as yours, is around uh, the productivity um, from a piece of land, uh, you know, in developing versus developed economies. There's quite a misalignment there. Uh, what accounts for that and how do you bridge that gap? Because surely that would go some way towards addressing um, the food security mm -hmm. issues as well. Well, I think, uh, I think Susie, you can... Oh, sorry, Susie, sorry. So I was going to say, I don't know if Susie wants to go or you, James. I'm happy to defer to Susie. Please, no, no, please I, go. James, I think, I think you should have a go because you're the food, really the food expert. 
I was, I was going to say that, you know, in my country, in South Africa, you can see these two different farming systems side by side. We've got a lot of large commercial farmers using high-tech production systems. Agriculture really is an industry, right? It's a business. And, and you know, with strong marketing links and, and so on and, and links to retail. And then we also have in my home province, you know, in, in KwaZulu-Natal, we've got a lot of small-scale farmers using really rudimentary technologies with very limited access to things like improved fertilizer and uh, farming practices, very limited extension advice um, being provided by the government and so on. And so, and, and so productivity is so much lower. Uh, land sizes are much smaller, so there's an economies of scale challenge, but, but, um, uh, but, um, but at the same time, productivity is so much lower. And it's so much more difficult to then you know, make contracts with big retailers and, and processors and so on. And so you get this bifurcation, this separation. And so without the financial incentives that come from being in these very lucrative supply chains, there's very little incentive to invest in these high tech uh, farming practices and, and technologies. And so I think you know, this is where we need a strong role for policy to sort of just make that leap, help smallholders make that leap um, so that they are sort of truly emergent farmers um, with, with sort of uh, deals being brokered um, partly on their behalf, but certainly in their interest. You know, Susie, I don't know if you want to add, but yeah. I would totally agree, agree with that. I know even in a country that is a, as advanced as New Zealand, you get enormous differences in productivity between the best and the poorest farmers. And it's to do with capital access, it's to do with training, it's to do with uh, the availability of local support and and these are all things that we we have a lot of understanding about because we've been doing it for a long time and productivity increases do happen in New Zealand it's sort of a one percent a year year on year for years and years and years um, but we need to work out how to accelerate that in in other places yeah no um, thank you very much for that um, Georgina Yeah, Georgina, moving over to you a little bit here. Uh, technology is critical for decarbonization, but so are other um, macro, macro factors as highlighted in your presentation, such as managerial leadership practices, et cetera. How do you see this um, evolve over the next five years? Well, I mean, hopefully what, what I try to show is that it's really not all about technology. It's about challenging the models challenging the way things are being done, are normally being done. It's not about being better at doing what we always did, it's maybe sometimes to do less, to do it differently, um, and also to do it more circularly. And I'd like to go back to what Doug was saying. Um, if we want to get serious about climate change, we need to go more circular. Um, we have an advantage with an event, is an event like ours uh, is, is going to be over end of 24. We're going to be dead as an organization. You know, we, we will cease to exist. So there was a motivation to be much more circular than any other business today. The world is circular at less than 10%. That means that less than 10% of the things we consume find themselves a second life, right? So there was a lot of motivation for us to uh, create the way of being more circular. And it started by creating the first materials footprints of the games. For example, we believe you cannot reduce what you don't understand. So we have estimated the materials footprint. And by understanding what comes into the machine, you can then try to reduce what comes into the machine before it goes out. And then when you know things are possibly going to go out end of 2024, then you need to find a second life for those things. Right. Uh, the, the, for example, we need 800,000 pieces of equipment to deliver the, the game. So pieces of furniture, uh, 100,000 electric equipment, 12,000 flags. Right. Uh, so it's a great incentive. Once you notice, once you realize all the resources that you are consuming, in a sense, uh, it becomes uh, much more obvious the need to secure a second life for those resources. So to your question of how I see things evolved over time, well, a lot of leadership is needed to make sure that all these changes happen. Uh, and then if we already start to sort of master the carbon, you know, and the climate effects, 
hopefully, and uh, you know, the world will become a, a lot more conscious about how more, much more circular it needs to be, because that will help us reduce the emissions, right? But also reduce the pressure on all the natural systems for all the critical resources that we need. Okay, just, um, I'd just like to remind the audience uh, to put your questions on the chat and then I'll, um, I'll pose them as we, as we go along. Uh, but just like to, you know, you re-look at, at, at some of the things that, or expand a little bit on the discussion that we've had so far. Um, so central banks and regulators are particularly interested in how technology development and adoption may impact the balance sheets of financial institutions. Um, this question is for um, you, Doug, um, and James. This is often done through scenario analysis. What will be the two or three scenarios that are likely over the next five to 10 years in terms of scaling up certain technologies and increasing their adoption? So where would you, where would you say these are the, the, the two scenarios, two or three scenarios that we should, um, we should think about um, costing them and trying to see what their financial implications or systemic implications across financial systems could be? Uh, James, are you okay if I launch in? Okay. Um, thanks for the uh, very good question. So, you know, there are there are many sources of uh, of scenario uh, innovations or scenario uh, thinking um, that I think are are valuable to just just to to have in in terms of understanding uh, the breadth uh, that of approaches. Uh, there are examples such as. Uh, uh, what Shell produces each year. There are examples that come from the International Energy Agency. There are examples that come from uh, the IPCC. Uh, and then there are examples from private firms like Bloomberg uh, oh, and many, many academics, including our own organization uh, and many others. So I think looking across that landscape to be mindful of uh, how to think about investment uh, theses and investment uh, profiles, I, I think there are three fundamentals. So if you look at that landscape, you can kind of partition it. What's the low end? The low end is essentially, I call it business as usual. Uh, and that's a, that's a valuable scenario to evaluate. Uh, consider barriers, consider uh, slow uh, momentum building, et cetera. That, that's important. The second is what I would call the most ambitious, which is the desired um, end of that scenario framework, which is a, a 1.5 degree scenario from the IPCC. It could also be called or equivalent to a net zero energy scenario from the IEA or a net zero carbon scenario uh, from the IEA. That includes transformation in um, agriculture, mobility, uh, power, uh, practices, et cetera. And then there's something in the middle, which uh, I think is a, a little bit of an art uh, for for one to choose, which is uh, what's uh, what's achievable uh, and and likely uh, if the most desired scenario, I'll call it the green swan scenario at the out at, at the ambitious side, uh, is not realized. And, and that would be the framing that I would uh, approach to in terms of thinking about the investment portfolio and the balance sheet element. I think the other piece to, to understand is that investments across this space have very different profiles relative to balance sheets. Uh, there has been a longstanding debate as to whether or not energy uh, investments are, uh, are infrastructure or actually can be structured uh, to look more like annuities. Uh, and if they are structured appropriately, uh, they can look much more like annuities. If they have a well risk mitigated uh, purchase agreement uh, that's affiliated with them, uh, where there's a guaranteed stream of income, looks much like a bond, uh, as long as it's structured appropriately. So let me stop there. James, you probably have some more, uh, more thoughts on, on how to approach scenarios. No, thanks, Doug. And, and, you know, again, 
knowing me, just I'll focus on the food system. And, and, and I think we've really got two scenarios going forward, very much like, like Doug was suggesting, but uh, two scenarios in the food system. I think one is just business as usual, right? Over the last two decades, um, we've had a very emissions intensive you know, development pathway for the food system. And it's been driven by ag growth and land expansion and so on. And, and, and there's been faster off farm growth in the, in the food system, sort of, sort of in those manufacturing and services sectors, but it's mainly been driven by the informal sector with fairly rudimentary technologies as well, just like rudimentary technologies used by farmers. I think this is the cheaper scenario. I think it's the simplest scenario. It, it is the business as usual one. And I think that's likely to have, it's not gonna have no implications for financial institutions, but I think it's probably fairly limited, not much different from what we've seen uh, recently where the financial in institutions have generally sort of underserved the, the, the food system. And then I think we've got a second scenario, which, you know, we said within five to 10 years was the question. And I'm not quite sure what we can see in the next five, 10 years, but at the very least we could start the transition to a more, to a higher productivity, lower emissions um, uh, agricultural sector. I think it's, it's crucial that we do start this transition, but it's likely to be expensive. Um, you know, we're gonna need to accelerate agricultural growth um, that means reducing deforestation and raising productivity, reducing deforestation like Susie's shown that it is possible. Um, uh, a lot of those technologies are off the shelf, but again, they are expensive for farmers, too expensive for many, many farmers in developing countries. I think we're going to need to see much faster downstream agri-food system growth, but away from the informal sort of low technology options. Um, so a lot more to hopefully still engagement of SMEs, but, you know, with much more reliable power and transport systems. And I think, you know, um, this is where a multi-sectoral approach is crucial um, because a lot of those downstream uh, parts of the agri-food system rely on the power and transport sectors where, as Doug has shown, sort of there are great opportunities to reduce emissions, but certainly not at, at no cost. I think, you know, switching to that second scenario is going to require a lot of financing and, and not just a lot of it, but also it needs to be affordable. And so there's going to have to be, and, and as Susie was saying, a lot of it's going to have to come from the private sector as well. You know, we cannot just rely on the government to finance this, this, this transition. Um, the technologies themselves are not inherently risky, but the agricultural sector is one of the more risky sectors to invest in. Um, it, you know, it faces weather shocks. Um, there's a wide range, as Susie was saying, a uh, wide range of capabilities and expertise amongst farmers, a very large population of farmers um, in developing countries. And so there's a strong role for sort of the government to help de-risk some of the, the, the private finance um, and so on. I think it's, so, so I think that second scenario, while absolutely crucial, is gonna be the more complicated, more expensive one. And we'll probably have a much larger uh, requirement um, from uh, financial institutions. So just thinking, you know, we've got these two different scenarios, the dream world and the business as usual, um, you know, which is most likely. And if I think about where we are today, we're coming out of a, in a world that's just faced multiple crises back to back. Um, there's been uh, huge uh, impacts on national incomes and so on. There's a looming debt crisis in many parts of the developing world. And I think governments are facing pretty binding fiscal constraints that are going to make it quite difficult for, to realize that second scenario. So I hate to say it, but I think, um, you know, that first scenario, that business as usual food system growth scenario is probably the most likely unless we have a concerted effort to sort of really turn the corner and, and, and change track. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for for that. Um, so th there's a there's a question for Susie here. Um, you know that that I'll I'll add on to. Uh, but you know, for many economies, funding is a problem when it comes to scaling up technology adoption. So, you know, developed uh, developed countries um, can often sometimes make promises that are not fulfilled. Um, yet it's also unrealistic to believe that taxpayers in advanced economies would be happy with massive fiscal transfers to governments with weak public finance management frameworks um, at a minimum. And, and, I, and, I, and I'd like to add a little bit to that question because I think uh, on some really important questions, it really comes to the heart of the matter. Uh, you've got a bit of a commons issue um, here where um, there is a commons that needs to be protected, but it, we're all kind of like passing the buck in terms of who should pay for that and who should be responsible. So there's also misalignment in terms of where these commons sit relative to where the finance sits. Um, and I think it speaks to also the idea of, around should the financing be public or should it be 
uh, should be private because private uh, financing also requires that there is an identifiable user who will pay um, and, and you don't necessarily have that when it comes to issues uh, of the commons. So, you know, I suppose that, that, is, that is the key question. How do you resolve a lot of these um, conflicts around who, who pays um, and, and who gains, essentially? So you might be, it's a common gain, but who pays for it? And do we have the institutional arrangements to get the payments done? And if we don't, how do we go about it? Well, that's a little question, Mama Kete, but uh, absolutely critical one. And you, you put your finger right on the, the crux of it. The fundamental problem here is that this is a commons problem and that everybody would like to free ride and let somebody else take the risks, make the changes, pay for the changes, etc. But if we all do that, then we're all going to end up in the worst possible outcome that we could. So we have to uh, to address that. And you know, I'm an economist. Um, I know positively that people can cooperate. Uh, you know, we have lots of evidence of that. Eleanor Ostrom has shown that repeatedly. And we know a lot about the conditions that are required for that. And a critical one is trust. That we, we need to develop trust. We need to have the information that allows us to develop trust so that we can see what each other are doing and, and we can really learn to work together. And that applies in this situation as much or more than it ever has before. So these we need to have trust from the point of view of the developed country who needs to take what might be politically risky actions. It might involve some upfront investment. Um, it certainly involves them doing something they weren't intending to do. Otherwise, they have to have trust that the developed countries are going to actually come through with the money, uh, that they're going to help with the technology, uh, the capability, support that is, is needed, et cetera. And so we need to construct models that will bring that trust. And that, that de-risking and providing of upfront support and uh, sort of technical support and so on, that has to have an element of the public involved. And that's the sort of thing that can be provided through multilateral development banks, through maybe to a small extent philanthropy, um, but also through official development aid or, or simply government getting um, involved and working together to help each other. Um, and then, of course, as you point out, you need trust for the other side too. That if you're going to, uh, if you're going to in a market buy a product from somebody else, you have to trust that they're going to deliver it and that what they deliver is what you were intending to pay for. And so this, this in a sense, is a contracting problem. So we need to make sure that those who are transferring or making the decisions about transferring the money have confidence that they're going to get something for that money. And that's where operating with good modelling that shows you that the money is going to be used in ways that have a good chance of being effective is really important. Um, and also uh, having... Um, uh, common understanding with the people you're working with so you know that their intentions are real, that they really want to, to do this, that they have a vision for how they're going to achieve it. And then making a big chunk of the money results-based so that there is a really strong incentive for the governments to actually follow through and not just tick the boxes and you know put the money in the right places, but actually do this those fine details that make sure that this stuff really works so that because they have a stake in it really working. And ideally you want both sides to have a real stake in, in the success of it. And, and I think that's where you really can make this happen. You know, taking a country like my own New Zealand, we need to make contributions globally to climate change if we're going to meet our climate obligations under Paris. We can't do it all domestically. So we need the people, whether that's Chile or, or other countries, we need them to be successful and to be seen to be successful so that we can say we worked with them and, and that's part of our contribution. So we have a stake in their success. They need to have a stake in their success. And, and then together we have to really put our heads together and make, make all of that function well. And it, it's not an easy problem. It is different from what we've done before. It involves blending different sorts of capital, different sorts of resources, and creating an investment environment where the private sector investors 
either have a compelling reason to do this because they need to prove that they're making a climate um, contribution. And in New Zealand's case, for our companies, it would be that they need to buy credits for the emissions trading system for their own regulatory compliance. Um, or, or in other cases, um, it's, it's yeah, simply for private gain, but they have an environment where they can make private gain. Uh, thank you very much for that, um, Susie. Uh, moving um, a little bit, um, you know, to to you, Georgina. Um, this is a a, a a question that comes from Jessica Shu on on the chat. She says um, you mentioned a carbon budget, which is a great example to follow. Will you be able to share a template and the estimate? Which is a great example to follow. Will you be able to share a template and methodology so others can follow when they plan for other events? Is that something that you guys could make available? We can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Ah, there. All right. Um, so, uh, Jessica, thank you very much for that question. That's a great question. And the short answer is yes. But let me tell you a bit more about that because Actually, when you think about, I would say, the carbon budget of, of, of the games, um, that's both the methodology that we developed to actually come up with that, to implement that, to use it over the years. Uh, we even developed some a software, sort of an accounting software, like an SAP, SAP of carbon for us to monitor the progress of the budget. So we've gone the whole way uh, to manage this as a true carbon budget. Uh, that's one thing. Then there's actually the calculations, you know, the model in itself, what you count in or out of your estimates for scope one, two, three. Uh, for that, we followed a methodology that exists. I mean, it's public. It's already in the IOC website, in the, you know, International Olympic Committee website. Um, so you can check it if you want, but it's adapted to like our event. You know, each event is rather special and in particular ours this is very big is the world's biggest event so you know ours is not necessarily transferable to other events but um we realized that uh, in sports in general and this is why the um uh, sports for climate action uh, framework was put in place with the united nations uh, sports has an opportunity to take the climate agenda uh, into account and to do more for the climate agenda. Um, and we believe that at least in France, where we are, where these games are happening, there was a potential to do something to help the French sport address this in a much more efficient way. Uh, and of course, doing carbon footprinting and all that has a cost. So instead of providing, I would say, a template, what we have developed is um, uh, an application that allows sports events to calculate their, uh, their carbon footprint, not at a perfect level, you know, but at least in a way in which you can see the big chunks and get um, recommendations from this intelligent application on how to reduce the emissions when you're organizing a sports event. I'm giving you the heads up because this is going to be announced about two weeks from now uh, publicly. Uh, so normally two weeks from now, you're gonna get to see that uh, on our website, and this is going to be a free tool uh, that we're going to leave as a legacy for of the games for all the uh, sports events in France. Thanks, um, and and a question for for you for you, Doug, um, from Buyongoto Kasia Lawi. Um, she asks, I hope it's a she. The chart um, you showed on BNEF data showing the growing pace of investments in green technology technologies was interesting. How much faster would we need to move to meet the recommendations of the latest IPCC report? Uh, thanks for the question. So just to remind folks, I, I showed a, a historical annual investment in the clean energy investment uh, sector uh, that include power generation and clean mobility and hydrogen and other pieces. And it was growing from a few hundred uh, billion to about 1.2 trillion in 2022, roughly. Uh, the estimates 
reflect again the key insights that I offered from the World Economic Forum work that has been done, and again other scenarios that inform that, is that that will likely triple or need to be tripled here in the next decade. So from a trillion per year to about three, between three and four trillion in the next decade, and then out uh, post 2040, uh, somewhere on the order of seven to eight trillion per year. So it's actually a fairly significant, um, you might call it upside investment opportunity uh, when you're looking at the total addressable market uh, that's actually gonna grow quite substantially. About 50% of that is estimated to be in electric mobility. So that's just not in light duty vehicles, but also medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and then about 50% of that in the power generation sector as well. So again, when we look across sectors, you see power, mobility, agriculture. And I, I think what's most interestingly from Georgina's example is that you can do it here and now. You just have to be very committed to doing it. Uh, and this is really about changing practices, changing approaches, measuring and monitoring uh, success in, in, in doing so. Um, thank, thanks a lot for that. Um, a question for, for James, um, very South Africa specific, um, asked by Constantine um, um, from, from the Saab. So Constantine asks, um, you know, how, you know, land reform, um, you know, policies around land re reform are seen as an opportunity to address inequality and poverty. Uh, and I don't think it's a, it's a South Africa specific problem. I think there are a few other countries that have got the same kind of challenges around uh, historical inequality around how land was distributed. And, uh, you know, but this also is a major threat to commercial farmers, which is the, the large scale um, that you maybe want to, to achieve. Um, how do we manage the tensions between, you know, the, the land inequality um, and, and the commercialization? How do you guys think about that? Um, well, so, I mean, I, in South Africa, it is a real tension because it's about taking land away from existing commercial farmers and, re, and, and providing it to small scale farmers. But one lesson that we can learn from other developing countries and in neighboring countries is that, um, you know, there are ways to uh, sort of what we call outgrower schemes in which large scale commercial farmers work with small scale farmers. Um, to uh, provide the scale that is needed to provide the surety of supply that uh, that big contracts with large retailing and processing firms need. And so it is possible that um, that you can set up a business arrangement in which you have a blend or a mix of both large scale and commercial farmers working within the same supply chain in a very coordinated way. Um, it's not flawless. It doesn't always work. There are risks associated with um, with uh, sort of um, with working with large numbers of small scale farmers, particularly if you're providing finance, if the commercial farmer is providing finance. But I think it is possible to set up a model in which um, the focus is is more around uh, setting up profitable value chains that benefit all the actors within the supply chain, as opposed to focusing on just the redistribution of the assets. Does that deal with the political issues of land reform? Absolutely not. And, and is it enough to offset the losses for commercial farmers whose land, the pure business losses that, 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 that they incur when their land is taken? I, I, I cannot comment. Um, over the long haul, it might, um, but in the short term, it probably wouldn't. So, um, but, but I think, you know, once it's decided that land reform needs to move forward, I think um, you have to look for, for these, um, uh, you have to look look for these business arrangements that are are going to benefit both sides, both parties, um, in this process. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I have a question. Um, I mean, any of you can can pick this up. Um, and and my question really relates to you know the kind of manufacturing versus waste versus what kind of manufacturing gets done where. So when you think about manufacturing um, and you, you think about uh, the, the amount of energy that we the, the amount of energy that we consume and consumerism, so to speak, a lot of the you know the lower the the, the lower value add um, type of products are manufactured in developing economies, 
a lot of the time those that kind of manufacturing has been the biggest supporter for um, growing a manufacturing and an export base for um, economies, for instance, in East Asia. So when you start to think about, um, you know, re rethinking consumption, um, then you may you may be creating smaller markets for developing economies that would be feeding into you know consumption globally. And when you do that, it it it, it closes a channel of development potentially for um, economies that are very far, far further down the value chain. So how do we think about you know, the implications for the type of development that is available, development pathways that are available for economies in the context where we want to reduce uh, production, you know, make everything more circular, as Georgina uh, kind of outlined, um, versus trying to, you know, get, um, you know, entire communities out of poverty. I don't know if this is a simple question or not, but I think there is there might be a little bit of a tension there as well between developed and developing economies as you transition or as you lower your carbon footprint. How do we think about that? That's I'm, standing I'm, question. I'm, oh, <laughs> sorry, James, if I'd known you were going to answer, I would have left you to it. Um, I, I think that's a great question we need to think more about. Um, there, um, and the key is making sure that there are activities that can happen in developing countries that use the sorts of skills that people have as they go along that development pathway. Um, so increasing the skills, uh, increasing the capital so that they can move more quickly up that chain from the very low uh, value added manufacturing of the sort that East Asia grew on is, is one approach. But also, if we're moving into a more circular economy, you might be ending up with a lot more labour intensive activities, uh, more quickly service oriented work that actually is, is very well um, is sort of suited for, for early development. So, so there could be some real upsides if we manage to make that transition. At the moment, it, it feels like that we could only dream that we reduce materialism and consumerism and that we face this issue. But um, but we do need to look forward to, to when we have that success. Um, thanks for that, Doug. You, you also had yeah. some thoughts. Mama Kitty, it's a, it's a great question. And, and maybe um, I'll, I'll perhaps um, reflect on um, the paradigm which has been used up to date, which, which is really about an export open uh oriented development path set of pathways and i think this is what you're referring to and i think that there's a fundamental opportunity to rethink that to rethink about i'll call it localization and local sufficiency uh, which implies that there is investment in innovation for developing i'll call it full supply chains to support self-sufficient local economic development by, by taking fundamental products all the way through the value add at the end and servicing the local economy as well as then export economies. And I think if that paradigm shift changes, one can actually conceive of uh, development pathways that are both economically um, aligned, but also culturally aligned with products and services that are self that support self sufficiency and self growth and opportunities for export as well. So it's a little bit of not export first, but self sufficiency first and export second. And there are some quite some thinking being done on this in terms of the economic paradigm approach for that. And I believe that that offers a very unique uh, set of circumstances uh, for this development pathway, including energy, for example, so that energy becomes self-sufficiency, particularly with renewable resources or clean energy resources uh, to develop more energy uh, services locally. So that's water, education, mobility, transport, manufacturing, also, food and water so go back to james's uh, elements there 
very important relative to food security, water security, et cetera. So when one takes a, a more of a local approach, one can conceive of development pathways, which are frankly quite attractive uh, from both a, a, a carbon footprint, but also from a resiliency footprint and I believe an economic footprint. And, and if I can just jump in, so, sorry, Georgina, to jump in, but um, I think adding to what Doug and, and, and Susie have said, I think you know a lot of what's been driving growth in the food system in developing countries has actually been the domestic market, um, although there's a lot of focus on exports. But right now, what we're seeing in many places, take Africa, for example, is a lot of exporting of primary agricultural products and a lot of importing of processed foods and, and, and food and agricultural products. And so there's this delinking and you could argue perhaps unnecessary transport emissions as we move goods, uh, primary agricultural goods to the point of processing and, and often sort of and then import the processed foods. And so I think what we have is an opportunity to sort of um, build out the full supply chain within developing countries and actually could lead to less trade but a more vibrant local economy for all the reasons that Doug, Doug has just mentioned. And so that's from a country perspective. If country means local, um, you know, we, we can make countries more um, complete in their own supply chains all the way from the farmer to the final consumer. And I think that could have a significant role to play uh, for, for reducing emissions long term. Thanks. If I, if I may add to, to this on a you know, from a food perspective of, of, of somebody who has to deliver 30 million meals. So it's not a country, right? But still, it's having to do that in, in, in twice 15 days. You know, it's, it's quite a lot of food. Um, and one objective we set for ourselves is to do it with the recommendations on the Par of the Paris Agreement for what the carbon footprint of a meal should be. And I think this is, again, another factor maybe to, to add is like, is development is everything, but also this, you know, how much can we afford in terms of carbon footprint of what we're going to eat in the years to come? And one of the things we wanted to show is that for an event like this, you can eat with less carbon footprint and, and you can have fun and you can go to a stadium and you can, you know, all that. Um, with a lot less impact on, on, on carbon. So it doesn't, it's not magic. It took us a lot of calculations, but you have to double up the amount of, um, of uh, vegetable proteins. You have to reduce the use of uh, a single use plastics. We're heading for more than 50%. Uh, you have to uh, source more locally, 80% of what we will be sourcing for the games is grown in France seasonally so just modify your menus just consume whatever is available right as opposed to your things that are uh, coming from uh, the other end of the world um and then fight food waste you know, which is something james you you were talking about that too so when you put all that together um you know you can actually do with a lot less carbon for developed economies like ours so i think we have to set an example as well for ourselves um, you know, in, in trying to think uh, in, in our own uh, terms and needs on how to bring down the emissions of the, of, of the food we're eating just for the good uh, of everyone, right? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for that. Um, I've, I've got um, one more all-encompassing question. I think you can use this as an opportunity. We've only got about six minutes left and I'd like everybody to have a chance to, to speak to this. Um, you can also use it as an opportunity to, you know, put in final thoughts. Um, but if, if you were each to put yourself in the shoes of different stakeholders, so Doug, you can be a government official in a developing country, Susie, um, a fund manager or a banker sitting in London, James, maybe a commercial um, farmer in Kenya, um, and Georgina, you are um, an environmental director of a multinational. Um, what would you do over the next six months to scale up technology adoptions and accelerate the green transition? So let, let me let me start by let me let me just uh, pick people's names one at a time. I'll start with Georgina. What well, would you, what, what would you do? I would in in six months. I would not focus on technology. I would focus on getting the right leadership 
on making sure that our the objectives are aligned, that the organization uh, has very concrete objectives and goals that are shared to everyone, so that then they can all focus on what needs to be done, whether it's technology driven, whether it's uh, just a business model change, uh, whether it's a shift you know, on service offerings, whatever it takes, but it's not necessarily in technology. And I think this is the main message I wanna leave behind is that when, when you think of what the world needs to do in the years to come, technology will do certainly a lot and we hope so, but it, it also takes a lot of change of behavior, you know, and changing the business models that we are offering. And um, Doug, you are a government official in a developing country? Yeah, so um, I think building off Georgina's uh, response, I would um, develop and lead an inclusive process among colleagues across each uh, agency of the government. So an economy-wide or an agent government-wide process to uh, require, if I can use that term, um, and develop implementation plans that are concrete, that lay out the required infrastructure, the, the planning, the building, the investment needs over the next, uh, say, 15 to 20 years, and to put those plans in place succinctly, or at least initiate them in the six months, hopefully accomplish a few of them, and have very clear signals to the bankers, to the private sector, uh, and to the stakeholder community that we're we're going to uh, follow these uh, development pathways for um, clean energy technologies as well as sustainability across energy, food, water, uh, materials processing. Uh, Susie, you're a fund manager or a banker sitting in London. I don't know why London. Um... After Brexit, it could be anywhere, really. But let's say <laughs> London for now. <laughs> so, um, so I would get a group of my junior staff uh, to start to follow the sort of processes that Doug is talking about and get a deep understanding of what is going to be involved in particular sectors and countries during the transition, understand where the opportunities are, what the risks are, what sort of packages would uh, need to be put together that my bank uh, can can potentially then support. And at the same time, I will get my senior, very sophisticated staff to engage with people who are working out how to mobilize funding for those places so that it's not designed by um, government officials or people in a multilateral development bank, but the, the bankers and the people who have the real money are involved from the beginning in designing packages that are really effective that I'm going to be able to invest in. And, and I'd start to make some little experimental investments through those, those um, mechanisms. So whether that's the Just Energy Transition Partnership or the LEAF Initiative or, or others, uh, in order to, to build up my capacity to do this so that as these things mature, this can become a mainstream part of my business and I can go on to be a successful banker even after Brexit. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, um, you know, and, and last but not least, James, you are the commercial farmer in Kenya. Okay, I'll be very quick. I'm just trying to decide who moves faster, a seasonal farmer or a public sector worker, employee, I'm not sure, government. <laughs> it's probably that the farmer, there's a limit to what you can do in six months in farming. And of course, it's just naturally a, a slow moving industry. Um, I think the first thing I would do uh, is join a commercial farmers union, because I think, uh, you know, you need to be at scale if you're going to pull risk, if you're going to access affordable finance, and so on, if you're going to motivate for policy change and policy support, you need to be working together. 
And I think, I know we've just said we need to cut back exports, but I think, you know, the incentive is to access new foreign markets, new export markets like, like the EU. And to do that, you need to be able to verify um, that you are sort of meeting climate um, commitments and so on, or contributing to meeting climate commitments, like, like Susie said. And those technologies and that verification is expensive, it's complicated. And so, um, you know, if we work together as farmers, putting myself in the shoes, I think, I think then, you know, we've got a much better chance of covering that cost and, and being far more successful. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think we, we've gone through quite a lot um, over, over two hours. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to end it there. Thank you so much uh, to our panelist, um, <clears throat> Doug Arendt, um, from, from um, uh, NRL, um, James Teller from um, International Food Policy Research Institute, it's a very long word, um, Georgina Grennan from um, the Ol Olympics Committee for Paris 24, and Susie Kerr, who is a senior VP and chief economist at the International De uh, Environmental Defense Fund. I think uh, that was a really, really good discussion. There's a lot that we put on the table. Um, thank you so much for so generously uh, participating in today's discussion and panel. And um, that'll be the end of the session. So uh, for the people on the, on, that are listening online, um, we have our next, we, we have a 30 minute break now and we'll have our next panel at um, half past half past three, and this one is on developing new technologies. Thank you very, very much, and, and have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.